Well, this seminar is um, five things I'd wish I'd learnt about PA years ago. Um, these are things that Pat and I, we put our heads together and we went, you know, if I was starting out again, I wish I knew this. Um, so we're going to take these. Um, so Pat, do you want to kick us off, please? I'll sir? kick us off. Fantastic. So, number one is gain structure. Uh, hands up, who has any idea what I mean by the term gain structure? A very small number of you. Okay, so we'll just uh, talk for a little bit. These are what we're going to look at. What is gain structure? Uh, the, one of the principal roles of a sound system is to make things louder. We do that by converting an acoustic signal to an electrical signal with a microphone and then increasing the level of that electrical signal before we turn it back into an acoustic signal with a loudspeaker. Uh, we also have various other tools such as sound desks which sit in the middle of that. All of these devices are designed to work at different electrical signal levels. So a microphone produces a very low level, we boost that to what we call line level of the sound desk, and then the level that needs to drive a, a loudspeaker is going to be significantly higher than the level that comes that is generated by a microphone. What do I mean by level? It's very simple, we, we turn an acoustic signal, which is a fluctuating pressure, into an electrical signal, which is a fluctuating voltage, and we're simply looking at what is the maximum displacement, the peak displacement of that voltage. So, a microphone is a transducer which turns an acoustic signal into an electrical signal. The electrical signal it generates is typically very low. Uh, I will explain line level in a minute, but we're, we're typically looking at anywhere between about 10 to 40 decibels below line level. So this is really a very weak e electrical signal. Line level, which is the, the level that most pieces of electrical audio equipment are expecting to work with, is defined as a nominal voltage of 1.228 volts root mean square. Uh, you don't really need to know that, it's just a figure. Uh, on your sound desk, if you're looking on, a, on, on the meters in your sound desk, this corresponds to about plus 4 dBU, uh, which is just in the little yellow blips on your, on your LED meter. Power level, which is a kind of, it's not really a technical term, but it's a useful word to describe it. This is the level that is output by an amplifier that drives a loudspeaker, uh, and this is going to be significantly higher. And we get between these various levels with several stages of amplification. So, at the input to a device such as a sound desk, we have a head amp or preamp, uh, and then at an amplifier that drives a loudspeaker, that, that's an amplifier, that's again, it's increasing the signal. So each amplifier stage is taking a signal and it's just increasing that voltage. Why is gain structure important? So gain structure is all about how we increase that voltage as it moves through our system. How we do that consistently, how we do that evenly, how we do that in such a way that the whole system functions as it's supposed to. Uh, and the main reason gain structure is important is because this is the primary purpose of what we designed a a sound system for, uh, and it's, it, if we get this wrong, nothing else is going to work. Uh, you know, you, you're going to encounter so many problems with everything else you're trying to do with your sound system if your gain structure is in the wrong place. So our two kind of core goals to gain structure, we want to achieve the best signal to noise ratio. So as sound travels an electrical signal through your system, various uh, noise kind of interference is induced, uh, and the stronger your signal, the less effect that's going to have. The second thing we want to do is avoid clipping or distortion. So various electrical components in the system are designed to operate in a certain voltage. If we put too high a level in, they're going to start to clip or distort, and they won't function properly. So really what we're aiming to do is, is at each stage of amplification, achieve the right level of gain to sit between those two problems and there's a nice little sweet spot in the middle. How do we set gain structure? Uh, the first and most important thing is nothing to do with any of your knobs on a sound desk. It's to do with placing your microphone in the right position. Now there's a whole session later uh, in, in the main hall with the musicians where we're going to look at this in more detail. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of introduce the concept here rather than explain it. Uh, but the, the, the main point is that if your mic is in the wrong place, you're, you're going to get a very weak level into the system uh, and you're already starting uh, on the back foot. 
Okay, so if we're in the sound check and we're trying to set up our game structure, one of the first things we really need to do is get a good, strong signal for the musician. Depending on how you run your sound check, which is something we're going to look at later as well, uh, this could be very easy or it could be very hard. Uh, so the important thing is to be very communicative with your musicians and just make it very clear to them what you need and why you need it so that you don't just have a bunch of musicians standing on stage, twiddling away, playing, not really sure what you're doing uh, and not giving you what you need. And the main thing you need is a good, strong signal. Now a lot of sound engineers will get up and they'll say, play the loudest you're going to play. That's not always helpful because sometimes people go completely over the top. What we want is a good, strong level at the kind of towards the maximum volume that a musician is likely to play. And then we get to the sound desk where we need to set our preamp game. So, at the top of a channel strip on a sound desk, you'll have a big red knob that says gain or head amp or preamp or something like that. And this is where we are controlling the amount of amplification of the signal as it comes into the desk. You'll also, on many desks, find that you have a, a strip of LEDs that can show you the level uh, if you PFL or solo that channel. Uh, and the main thing we're looking for when we're getting a good strong signal is that that corresponds to a good strong signal level on the desk. So you want to turn your head amp up and ideally with a good strong signal you want to be just coming into this yellow zone here. Uh, so when the musician is, is playing at their strongest level we are arriving at about plus three, which, as we identified earlier, is about line level, which is the level that your desk is expected to work at. So you, you can just work for every channel on your desk, getting every musician to play at a nice, strong, consistent level, and that's the main thing we're aiming for. Now, there are a few slightly different approaches to this. Uh, for instance, some people like to set all the faders to zero and then mix off the head amps. Uh, I'm going to suggest that's not a particularly helpful thing to do because your head amp affects a lot of things. Uh, it will affect all the mixes out from your desk, not just the main mix out of your front of house system. Uh, so I'm going to suggest this is the best way to do it. We, we just want to aim to be getting a good strong signal that's just getting into that yellow as a musician gets to their kind of strongest point. Now when they're playing quietly, it won't be up in the yellow, that's fine, that's not a problem. Uh, the, the main thing is that, that when, we're, when they're playing at their loudest, we're getting a very good strong level here, but we're not getting up to this red, which is where your desk starts to clip or distort and adds a lot of nasty noise. Setting power up gain, I'm just going to talk about this very quickly. This is something that you wouldn't necessarily do on a regular basis, particularly if you have a, an installed sound system. Uh, but the, the other part of the amplification is the power amp, which is what drives your loudspeaker. Uh, sometimes, for instance, in speakers like this, it can be built into the speaker. We have a little power amp actually built into the sub in the back here. Other times it might be a completely separate box which is connected to the loudspeaker. Uh, what are we trying to achieve with power amp gain? Uh, it's a similar kind of thing. We want to make sure we're getting the best possible signal to noise ratio. Uh, and we want to make sure we're not clipping or overdriving or distorting anything. Uh, so the way I would normally go about this would be to produce a nice consistent line level signal out of your desk. Uh, again, the amplifier is expecting a line level input. So uh, just a CD or something like that, that you can put at a nice consistent line level. And then we're just going to adjust the output level of the amplifier so that we are getting a comfortable level. Uh, you can do this with, with a CD, you can do this with the band playing. There are various ways of doing it. Uh, but the main thing we're, we're ensuring is that we're not driving the amplifier too hard and then having to pull the level right down on the desk so it's not too loud. If we do that, what we're actually doing is we're transmitting potentially over quite a long cable run from the sound desk to the amplifier, a very low signal level, uh, which could be lots of noise could be occurring on that. Uh, or if we're not driving it hard enough, you're going to run out of volume. No matter how hard you push it on your desk, you may end up clipping your desk to try and get it louder, uh, and you still can't get enough volume out. Uh, over to Tim. Thanks, Pat. Uh, how does this work? There we go. Brilliant. Um, so, now we know about gain structure, I want to talk about what do all the desk controls do. <coughs> I'm going to do a very, very quick overview. Usually I would do this in about two hours, um, and it's a lot of fun. Um, but we're going to have as much fun in 
much shorter amount of time. So the first thing we're going to do is channel gain and EQ. I'm going to swap mics and I'm going to demonstrate this. So, you can't hear me, correct? Well, you can, but you can't hear me through the PA. So, the first thing I'm going to do, um, as Pat was saying, is I'm going to grab my gain control. Um, now, the way I sound check, uh, which is what Pat was talking about a minute ago, is I'm going to stick my fader to minus five. Then I'm going to grab my gain, because the gain, as Pat says, increases the amount of volume, amplifies the electrical signal coming through. Now, I'm not doing this by the meters in, um, straight away. But the meters are important, as Pat said, because if I'm hitting the red in the meters, I'm distorting everything. That's bad. We don't want red lights. I'm listening first because I'm a sound engineer, and then I'm going to reference and look at the meters. Um, don't just do it by the meters, oh yeah, it's orange, that's perfect. No, do it by sound. If your system is set up correctly, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't be hitting the red and you shouldn't be tickling um, just into one light every time. So I'm going to spin in the game control until I get to a certain level. And um, Are you all happy you can hear me now? Yeah, now I'm going to check that the meters are all right, and they are, which is nice. Okay, so that's the input gain, that's what that does. Now it might be that I have absolutely no control of my mic because it's coming in so loud, maybe we've mic'd up an electric guitar, uh, they are notoriously loud, I am an electric guitarist so I'm going to say that. Um, it might be, I just have no control over it, and my... my um, my dial here is right the way down as far anti-clockwise as it will go. In which case I'm going to use my mic line pad which is going to change the gain structure and it's going to give me the ability to, um, to change the scale of it. Imagine it's graph paper and rather than using lines kind of 1 to 100 I'm only able to use 1 to 5 because my gain's so high, that's as much control as I've got. If I hit the mic line pad, I'm changing the signal structure um, and it means I'm changing where in the graph paper I'm able to work. And I want to be able to get a nice um, consistent signal so I can use every single line on my graph paper. Some mics need phantom power, um, particularly DI boxes as well, they'll need um, phantom power. This is just a 48 volt signal that's sent down the, um, the cable uh, into the mic. This mic doesn't need it because it's dynamic. A condenser mic, uh, which is perhaps something we're going to put on a flute or uh, a wind instrument like that, or maybe a choir mic or a lectern mic, they will all need phantom power. Um, hopefully you'll know when uh, if you need phantom. If you're unsure, you can just stick phantom on because you're not going to electrocute yourself. Um, I have done, that's a story for a coffee break. Um, polarity inverse here. Um, I'm going to change, I'm going to push that button and I want you to tell me what's happened, okay? Uh, so the button is currently out and now it's in, okay? And I want you to tell me how the sound is changing. The, it's now out and I'm going to push it back in now. Oh, there was a little pop there, but what's changed to the sound of my voice? It's now out again. Okay, any, any ideas? What's changed? Yeah, just clipping the treble out. It, uh, it clips a little bit, okay, and? Clipping the treble out a bit. Uh, it takes a bit of the treble out, okay. Any other takers? People shaking their heads, what does that mean? Does that mean you don't know? I'm shifting the phase by 180 degrees, yes, but what's it doing sonically to the sound? Of, what's the audible change? Nothing, people say? Muffled. Muffled, okay. Um, well, the honest answer is it's not doing anything um, to one mic. If I have two mics, then it will change. For example, if I'm double micing, this is quite a rock and roll thing to do, I'm sorry. If you double mic a snare drum, one top, one bottom, or you do the American president thing of having two mics on a lectern, um, if you knock one of those out of phase, it doesn't matter which one, um, it will change the sound. Now, there is no right or wrong answer as to what, uh, in which settings you should inverse the polarity. Um, if it sounds right and you like the sound of it in one way, that's the right way to do it. If you don't like the sound of it, then don't do it. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Can I just... Yes, very quickly. please. Where's the air? Okay. Just to explain in a little more detail exactly what's going on with that, we'll go back to my uh, this picture. When we hit the polarity reverse button, if this is your signal, what we are literally doing is turning this upside down. So we would get a wave like that. So rather than going up first, yeah. it goes down. The gentleman at the back said we are shifting the phase by 180 degrees. This isn't quite technically correct. Phase is frequency dependent. Uh, so there is no way 
uh, to shift the phase of every frequency in a wave by 180 degrees simultaneously. Uh, it's, it's, it's not practically possible from a phase effect. So what we're actually doing is inverting the polarity of the signal, uh, but it's, it's the same effect if we could possibly simultaneously invert the phase of every frequency by 180 degrees. There we go. Thanks, Pat. Now, but out to my turn. <laughs> Thanks, you like driving. Um, okay, everybody following so far? We're not boring you, I hope. Um, 100 hertz bass cut. Can you hear? My mic is a bit boom, boom, a um, bit boom in the, in the low end. So I have this button that says um, 100, or oh, HPF 100. Actually, the button is in. This is what it sounds like with it out, and it's a bit Barry White. And now I'm going to stick it in, and there's a slight change right down in the low frequencies. It's just got a little bit, little bit less boomy. Um, which is really helpful, but what happens if I've got it in at the moment um, and I'm cutting out that bass, but I, I still need more tonal control? Well, here are three frequencies that I think are brilliant for a vocal. So if you've got a pen and paper, you might want to write these down. Um, this is a starting point, and it's not gospel, okay? Um, so it's just a suggestion that I find helpful. So please don't um, think this is going to work every time. Okay, first thing I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to turn my EQ on. Uh, you see at the bottom here we have an EQ bypass. I need to make sure that's not in. Um, so I'm going to boost my low frequency. Here we go. Ooh, that's a big room, isn't it? Jump in the back. Um, this is the low frequency. I, I can't even... There we go, I'll take it out. Um, it's really boomy um, and it, in a vocal, useless. So I'm going to wind that straight out. Um, on any vocal mic, wind it out. In fact, I'm going to wind it out on everything except a kick drum, a, you know, the bass drum, uh, a bass guitar or double bass, maybe a cello, um, a <coughs> keyboard that has been DI'd, i.e. not a grand piano that's mic'd up, and anything that's playback, so an iPod or a CD or a DVD or a... Hello, yes? What do you mean wind it out? Uh, I'm going to... Um, I have the ability... So, thank you. Um, I have, you see here, I have, this is zero at 12 o'clock. I'm not cutting or boosting my signal anyway. If I add it, I'm going to wind it clockwise, and I can go up to 15 decibels more on that particular frequency, which in this case is 100 hertz. If I cut it, then I'm winding it anti-clockwise as far as I can, and I'm taking that frequency out. Thank you, great question. Um, so my, uh, so I'm going to get rid of the bass. My three frequencies then are 300 hertz. Hello. Are you getting rid of the bass completely, or just? Yes, I'm getting, winding it right out because there's nothing in my voice that helps you to, uh, for the intelligibility. <coughs> so I'm just going to get rid of it. Um, <coughs> problem with cables. Okay, uh, 300 hertz is the first frequency I'm going to go to, and this is what it sounds like if I boost it a bit too much. It's getting a bit nasal and a bit boomy. Um, but it's not quite so nasty boomy as it was. Um, if I take some out, then I'm going to take it the other way. This is what it sounds like without. So it's a bit thin, a bit, bit nasal and nasty. Um, so for my voice today, I think I'm going to set it about there. Um, for somebody who stands back from the mic a little bit, I don't like that. I want the mic in the mouth. But if you do uh, have people who insist on holding the mic back a bit, you can add that in just to add a bit more warmth into the sound. I'm going to bash through. Um, the next one I'm going to choose is 1000 Hertz. This is the, uh, the train on platform three is coming in. Um, that's 1000 Hertz. And if I wind it up, it gets really nasal and train station-y. That is a word. Um, I don't like that. Um, so I'm going to wind some out a little bit. Of course, if I wind too much out, it sounds nasty as well. So I've got to be careful not to wind too much out uh, for today, I think. Yeah, about there. Sounds all right, of course. I have to check off the speaker because I can't quite hear it. That sounds about right. Yep. Um, the other one I'm going to do is 3,000 hertz. Uh, so 300, 1,000, 3,000. And I'm going to find that. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm using the green control and I'm choosing my frequency. Uh, and then I'm on my mid sections here, I'm just using the blue one to add or subtract that particular frequency. Um, my high frequency, if it's a bit too then I'll wind that in or out accordingly. Um, generally, I'll just keep it straight at 12 o'clock because I'm lazy. Um, so this is what 3000 hertz sounds like. Everybody all right? Yeah? Hey, Sorry. Just, just so you know, the, green, the green and the blue. The green one, I choose which frequency I want to use. Which um, one did you choose? Uh, both the low mid and the high mid 
um, cross over on each other. So I'm going to use the one that gives me most control. So to be honest, it doesn't really matter as long as I don't choose the same frequency on both cut one and boost the other. Um, perhaps I'm going to look at 1000 hertz in the low mid, which is actually the limit of this. Um, Presumably a simple desk will just have a single control. It could do, yes, indeed. Yeah, and the problem with something like this is so many desks operate in a different way. Um, but these are just suggestions that I find helpful. So I'm unclear what your suggestion is when you get that choice. Okay. Um, if I need both 1000 hertz and 3000 hertz control, then I have to put 1000 hertz in one and 3000 hertz in the other. Okay. Um, if I only need one, then really it doesn't matter which I'm choosing. If I'm choosing 300 hertz, then I'm going to have to do that in my low mid because my high high mid won't get down that far. It will only I think it starts at 500. Um, but that's desk to desk, it will change. Hello. Yeah, so is it, the desk you're playing with there, is, is that got three green adjustments and the one that's feeling got two? Uh, no, it's exactly the same. Okay, sorry. I don't know if I get it, you've got, only got two green buttons to adjust. Uh, yes, I only have two on this one as well. So what I'm doing is I'm going to say, of my three frequencies, I only have the ability to choose two of them at a time. So I'm going to choose either 300 or 1000 in my low mid, and in my high mid I'm going to choose uh, 1000 or 3000. So I just have to work with the best I've got. A bigger desk will have even more scope. Um, I find that the, uh, the 1000 works quite well on male vocals and the 3000 a little more on female on vocals. On female so vocals. A kind of register thing there that works. There we go. So I'm going to boost up the 3000 hertz now just so you can hear what that sounds like. It's pretty, um, pretty shrill. To be honest, if you're unsure about EQ, as I say, wind out the low and then stick everything at 12 o'clock. Because if you've got a great sounding singer or instrument, you've got a great sounding speaker system, then you just can't go wrong. Um, next thing I've got is my auxiliary outputs. Now, obviously, I've got my main outputs, which are sending to my main PA. Um, but as I work down my channel strip, I also have these auxiliary outputs. And in the same way that in the armed forces you have main troops and auxiliary troops or reserve troops, these are reserve outputs or auxiliary outputs. Now, I can split these into one of two ways. I can either have a pre-fade auxiliary or a post-fade auxiliary. A pre-fade auxiliary is where I can spin into my, uh, my monitor, for example. Here's a monitor. I happen to have it on a stick um, just to make it a bit easier. There we go. OK, so I am currently working. I've set the desk to be a pre-fade auxiliary. Can you hear now? The sound is coming out of this speaker. Um, because it's pre-fade, the sound that I'm sending doesn't correlate at all to the fader position. So I can push the fader up and down the track as much as I want, and absolutely nothing is going to change in that monitor. Are you, you happy that that's the case? OK, now I'm going to change it to a post-fade. Now it's post-fade, and as I pull the fader down, oh look, my, uh, my mic level in this speaker, my monitor, has changed. So that's the difference between pre-fade and post-fade. A pre-fade auxiliary is not affected by the channel fader, whereas a post-fade is affected, in fact it's proportional to. Um, why would we use uh, a pre-fade auxiliary? Well, perhaps um, the most obvious one is a stage monitor, your fold-back monitors for the band, uh, or an independent recording feed if you're being really fancy. A post-fade auxiliary really is everything else. So um, recordings, loop feeds, uh, feeds out to a crash room, um, effects, all sorts of things. Can you just uh, say how all this is relating to, have you got a main? Yes, so I have a main fader. So In all this setting up and how it's affected, how, how's your big red ones affected by all this? Uh, let's have a look at that, shall we? Here's my, uh, here's my master fader. Let's get rid of that. So, otherwise, I'm going to push my, my input fader up and down, and of course it's going to affect what's going on in the PA. Now, these are my master faders, so if I pull these down, my whole PA is going to come down, my whole speaker system is going to reduce in volume. Um, I need these to be set, some people say at zero, some people say at minus five. Really it's kind of academic, as long as it's there and you don't touch it. Because um, as Pat said, we need to make sure our gain structure is correct. Um, it's a bit like um, learning to drive without the cars on the road. Um, but I think that we should tape our master faders down, not ever touch them. And if it's too loud, it's because we've mixed it too loud on our inputs. The master faders are the overall level that we're sending to the amplifiers, to our speakers. 
Um, so for me, lock them down, don't touch them. If you can get a cattle prong or something that electrocutes you every time you touch it, then even better. Um, perhaps not appropriate in a church, though. Um, if you've got everything balanced on these inputs to the relative things you want, yes. you can then use the master failures if you want the whole lot to go up or the whole lot to go up. I could do, that's quite right. But um, very often in a speaker system, the master faders aren't just affecting the main speakers. For example, I can pull things off of my master faders in a fancy matrix way, for example, and I can derive a feed off of my master mix. So if my recording feed is coming off of my master, we think, oh, well, it's a bit loud in the PA, I'll turn it down. Now the recording feed has also been affected, and the crash feed has been affected, depending on how the system's set up. Um, for me, the art of mixing is uh, using the input faders only and leaving the output faders where they are. If you need to um, turn the band up, you push the input faders up for the band. Or you can use a group, a subgroup, to push the band up. It goes back to the gain structure it does. I was talking about earlier as well. If you push all your faders up and then you think, oh, it's a bit too loud, so I'm going to pull my master faders down, what you're actually doing is within the desk, your gain is coming up and then you're pulling it down again, and then it's going back up again. Uh, and you're actually increasing the total amount of, of upwards gain you need to include in the system, which will exacerbate any noise or anything like that. Uh, the idea is we want to start down here and we want to go continually upwards. So if you set your, your master faders at a specific level and then mix off the channel faders around that, you're keeping that consistent gain structure. We have little mini meters for our outputs, for our master outputs, and we have mute buttons. So the classic mistake that I make is that I mix my bands and I get my monitor set and I realize that I have my master volume, my master outputs muted. Of course, you're not going to hear anything. doesn't matter how high my channel gain is. If my output mutes are muted, then I'm not going to hear anything. Um, if I want to group my instruments to give me an easier life in the mixing, then I can use my subgroups here. This desk happens to have four faders. Um, and I can put my, perhaps, drums and bass onto one. Um, as Andy and Tim were saying earlier, they're providing my, my groove <coughs> and my bass line is putting some um, harmony into that groove. Maybe I'm going to put my band onto it, so my keyboards and my guitars. Um, here on group three, I could put my uh, instruments, my uh, violins, my flutes, and my uh, so on. And then on the end, maybe I'm going to put my vocals. That's one way of using the subgroup. And it's just a really nice way. All oh, my vocals aren't quite high enough, I can push the subgroup up there to do that. Of course, we need to be careful not to drive those right down high and then have far um, input faders pushed right to the top because, as we know, that's um, changing the gain structure of the, of the desk. Right, I've had enough. Here we go. Let's, let's move on. Tag team. Okay, feedback. Everybody understand the feedback, what I mean by feedback? It's that horrible thing when you get a really nasty whistling or a howl or a hum or something through your sound system. Uh, it's, it's a sound engineer's worst nightmare. Uh, as a professional sound engineer, uh, it, you, you can't do it. Uh, <laughs> if it happens, that's the kind of thing that stops you getting work. Uh, so you want to avoid it. But it, it can be really hard and it happens. Uh, and there are, I'm going to explain to you why it happens. So, why does feedback occur? Here is a very simple sound system. We have the source, let's say a vocal, goes into a microphone. Goes from the microphone to the mixing desk, to the amplifier, out of the loudspeaker. The problem we have is that the sound coming into the microphone is not just the sound coming from this source, it's also sound coming from the loudspeaker. This is feedback. Feedback is a loop where we take the sound through the system and it comes out and it feeds itself back into the system and we now have sound going round and round in a loop. You'll most commonly find this on a, a tie clip radio mic, you know the ones that the, the preacher wears. Because the mic is so omnidirectional, it's like God, it hears you wherever it is. Um, and it's all the way down here. It's not just hearing my voice, it's hearing everything else around, yeah. it's hearing the speakers, it's hearing the, the Venue, it's hearing the band and all sorts. So that's the mo that's the easiest one to get feedback on. Yeah. The, the, the feedback as a kind of principle will always occur in a live sound system with any mic. You can't uh, escape from it. Uh, the problem is it depends on the, the level of that feedback loop. Is that feedback loop increasing? Is it decreasing? Uh, so I'm going to go through three very quick scenarios for you. Scenario number one. 
feedback level is significantly quieter than the source level. So we have the source coming in and it's coming to the mic at a certain level. We have the feedback loop coming around, it gets back to the mic. By the time it gets here, actually, it's a lot quieter than the initial source. What happens? The feedback loop is rapidly diminishing. There's no noticeable ringing or howl or anything. This is happening right now. I'm talking into this microphone, it's coming out of these loudspeakers. This microphone can hear these loudspeakers, but we don't hear the nasty effects of feedback because it's so much quieter from these loudspeakers than it is from my mouth because I've glued it right to my face. Uh, we'll talk about mic technique later, but this is a good thing to learn. Scenario number two, feedback level is only slightly quieter than the source level. So what happens now is that the feedback loop, it, it's still going to diminish, but as I talk, what you'll probably hear is a slight ring off the end of, of everything I say. Uh, and So we have a loop and it's going round and it's going to start to ring, but it's not going to get out of control. It's not going to produce some horrible howling rings. Uh, this is not very pleasant, it sounds a bit weird, uh, but it's, it's, it's not the worst case scenario. Scenario three is the worst case scenario. Feedback level is the same as or louder than the source level. So now I'm talking to the microphone, it's going through the system, out to the loudspeaker, and there's so much gain in this system that by the time it gets back from the loudspeaker to the mic, actually it's louder than the source I'm putting in. So now what's happening is that every time it goes around this loop, it's getting louder and louder and louder and louder. And it's going around this loop hundreds of times a second. Uh, and you're going to get that horrible, nasty ring or howl that just carries away and it'll keep getting louder and louder and louder until the system can't get any louder or until the clever engineer finds which channel it's on and turns it down. Yeah, so feedback loop is increasing, growing uncontrollable ringing issues. This is the nightmare, this is what we want to avoid. How do I stop it? You can't. Feedback always occurs uh, in any live situation. Uh, as I say, this mic can hear these loudspeakers. I can't stop that happening, but if I understand how feedback occurs, I can take actions to avoid and limit its effects, as hopefully you can see we're demonstrating right now, we're not getting horrible feedback. Sorry? We did try and demonstrate it We did try and demonstrate so, yeah. it. Actually, this system is so good, it's almost impossible. <laughs> there we go, there we go. We've managed to achieve it. Okay, gain before feedback. Uh, gain is the increase in acoustic energy generated by amplification through a sound system. Gain before feedback is the maximum achievable gain before we get that nasty ringing. So this is the limit on how much, essentially, we can turn a source up through our sound system. How do I stop feedback? If you keep your system below gain before feedback, you don't get the nasty whistling. It's not rocket science. What if you need more level? So we've found we're, we're not in a lovely system like this, where we can stick a microphone right in front of the loudspeaker and we don't get feedback. We're in, uh, we're in church and if we're trying to turn something up, and it's a little lapel mic, and we can't get enough volume out of it before it rings. What do we do? Increase source level at the input. So this is, let's, let's make the source louder, essentially. Uh, so we can turn the source up, or we can position the microphone close to the source. You can, we know that sound decays over distance. As the microphone moves away from my face, you can't hear me as well. The closer the microphone gets, the louder it's hearing me. Now, it's still hearing the sound that's coming out of the system the same volume, but it's not hearing me the same volume. If I were to then try and turn the system up so you could hear me clearly, we would get to that point where we get to game before feedback and it starts whistling. So if I move it closer, I've increased, but I haven't increased game before feedback, but I don't need to put as much gain into the system because the microphone is already hearing me louder. What else can we do? Improve game before feedback. Uh, you can reposition the microphone. If, the, if I'm stood over here as a vocalist, this is a dangerous place. We know this system's quite safe. Most sound systems, you probably couldn't get away with doing this. Uh, so you can try repositioning the microphone and the speakers. This is why you always want to be stood behind the line of the loudspeakers rather than in front of it as a performer. Uh, similarly, with monitors. Uh, a monitor that's right in front of a musician with the microphone in this orientation is fantastic because the microphone is pointing directly away from the monitor. Uh, 
if you start doing some slightly weird things where you're kind of positioning your microphone like that and you've got a monitor down here, we're getting closer to the axis of the microphone where the microphone hears the most noise uh, and we're getting very dangerous. Over to again. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Um, radio mics, this is one of my great loves. Um, when we do a big event at SFL, um, we have to plot all the radio mics to make sure that they don't interfere with each other. I'm sure you've heard the kind of noises you can get on a radio mic system. Um, my job at SFL, what I partly get paid for is to stop that happening on our gigs, which um, usually involves sitting at a computer and waiting for the program to run its course. Anyway, um, what is a radio mic? Uh, a radio mic is a transmitter, i.e. the mic, um, and a receiver, uh, which we happen to have sat at the back here. Um, wirelessly, um, through the magic of science, uh, the microphone, which could be a handheld, of course, or a belt pack, um, is talking to our receiver. Um, the receiver is then plugged into the sound desk. Um, a lot of people think that a radio mic reduces cables. If anything, I would say it probably doubles the amount of cable. Um, but at least it makes it hands-free and you don't have to have a, a microphone, uh, sorry, a cable around your feet. Um, we have to tune our transmitter, our mic, and our receiver to the same frequency. We have to sync them up. Because if, our, if my mic doesn't know to talk to my receiver, then it's never going to work. Um, this has to be a unique frequency. By unique, I mean different to any other within your building. Um, of course, the problem is you may well have somebody down the road who has the same mic on the same frequency. That's probably going to be um, a challenge as well. Um, but yeah, a unique frequency. Um, in the UK, this can be anywhere between 470 megahertz right the way up to 865 megahertz. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to lob some six-digit numbers at you now. Um, to make it easier to administrate, uh, the radio frequency spectrum, or the RF spectrum as we use the shorthand term, is split into eight megahertz channels. Um, Ofcom have a branch called JFMG who are very good at this. Um, if you ever get bored and you're awake at night and you just need to jump on your iPhone and have some kind of, I need to fall asleep reading material, um, jfmg.co.uk is a brilliant site for that. Um, unless you're like me and you actually get a kick out of this. Um, so channel 21 is the very first one. As I said, it's 8 megahertz channels. So it starts at 470 and it goes up to 478 megahertz. And then we jump into channel 22, which goes from 478 to 486. And we keep going up and 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 up until we get to channel 70, which is 863 to 865. Now for those of you who are good at maths, that's only two megahertz, not eight megahertz, because there's always one exception to every rule, and channel 70 is said exception. Do I need a license for my radio mic? Well, it depends. Um, the short answer is almost certainly, unless you are working in channel 70, which some people call the deregulated, I, I don't think channel 70 is the technical term, but in my mind it helps, otherwise I get confused. So deregulated means exempt from any licensing. Anyone in the UK can grab a mic, tune it into the deregulated channel 70 window of 863.0 all the way up to 865.0, and you can work free of any licensing in there. Brilliant. Um, the next step is to go into channel 69 just a bit lower, and I can buy a shared license, 75 quid a year, and I can tune, I think, a dozen radio mics into that window, nice and easy, um, 75 quid a year. Um, frequency specific license is where you're not in channel 69 or you're in channel 70, you're way out anywhere down to 21 or beyond. Um, you pay, I think it's 28 pounds per year per frequency per postcode. There's lots of pers in there. Um, it's a very expensive way of doing it, but if you're a church like HDB and you're in central London and you need a whole bunch of radio mics on the go, you can't use the obvious windows because the Victoria and Albert Museum and all the venues and the science museums and everything is already using those windows, which makes it very complicated for HDB, the poor guys. Um, so, do I need a licence? It depends. Yes, unless I'm in Channel 70, my deregulated window. Um, 
as I said, it's an 8 megahertz window. Um, this is channel 70 all the way up here. As you can see it's tiny weeny, tiny weeny. Um, it's only 2 megahertz, and I can only get about 4 radio mics into that window. Um, with all the others, I can get a lot more. And that's four if you buy the decent ones. Yes. If you go and buy a five pound radio mic from your local music shop, yes. you won't get four of those in there. No, unfortunately not. AKG is only three, unfortunately. Yes, AKG is only three. It depends. Sennheiser claimed to do six. Um, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, the Sennheiser rep was a good friend of mine. He's not yet proved it to me. Um, okay. The more radio mics you have on the go at any one time, the harder it gets to operate without interference problems. Um, the interference problems are actually called intermodulation frequencies. Um, as you can see, this is my software that I've taken a quick screenshot of. These, um, I plotted, what is it, seven radio mics into this window here, um, into one channel, and all these little white dots are the harmonics produced by that radio mic. You know when I hit a piano and I get a note out of it, I don't just get one note, I get all the notes associated with that, um, the harmonics. It's the same with a radio mic, unfortunately. Um, these are the interference patterns, and if my harmonics start to clash, that's where the interference comes in. That's um, a real challenge. Um, so in the really, really big worlds where we do an event for Hillsong and they need 40 channels of radio mic, um, we have to use an RF plotting software to do that, um, and then you have to pay somebody probably to do it. Um, it took me about three years to learn this software because it's really clunky and nasty. Anyway, I'll stop ranting. A um, uh, gentleman at the back has very kindly um, teed this up for me already. The digital switchover has changed everything. So in a world where I could, um, a couple of years ago, I could buy a radio mic up here in channel 70 and it exempt from any licensing. If I need a few more, if I, I've got my four, oh, I need a fifth now. Oh, that's all right. I'll just buy a channel 69 shared license just here and I'll tune my radio mics down into that nice and easy. Well, unfortunately, I can't do that now. I can either buy a, a radio mic that can tune into channel 70 or I can buy a system that will tune all the way down here into channel 38 and it's associated um, channels. Um, so, if I'm buying a radio mic, I have two choices. I know in five years' time that I need um, more than four radio mics. Then I must buy in channel 38, and then I'm forced into my £75 a year licensing window. Otherwise, uh, if I know I'm ever going to be running on four, that's fine, I'll stay up at the end, unless of course you're in a part of the country where you have real problems in that window. Um, so I want to summarise very quickly, radio mics need a transmitter and receiver, they've got to sync up. Um, four systems, there's some suggested frequencies, I think they're in all the manuals of all the radio mic books that are out there. Um, if I need more systems, I've got to look at a shared licence. Um, obviously I've got to get my frequency correct in a quick setup way. I've got to get a good line of sight between my transmitter and my receiver. I was in a church the other week and um, the church office was through a, a door, down the corridor, 50 paces on the right, turn left again, and there's the office, and the radio mic receivers were in there, and they were wondering why their radio mics always went <laughs> And yeah, you've got to have a good line of sight, otherwise it won't work. Um, walls aren't very good with lines of sight. Um, my gain structure, I've got to get my mic set up properly. Again, it's the same thing that Pat's been um, talking to us about get my mic set up correctly, um, and then I've got to get, so that's in the mic, and then I've got to get my receiver set up correctly and get the output of that. For larger systems, um, radio mic uh, antenna distributions are a godsend. Must use them, I would suggest. Rechargeable batteries, probably not that helpful. Um, some people do it and it works well. Most people do it and it doesn't work so well. Don't use them, would be my suggestion, because they're more likely to fail mid-preach, and that's bad. Fantastic. We have about one minute remaining, so I'm going to fly through this. If you have any questions, we'll be in a Q&A session later. It's too loud. Uh, hands up, guys here who actually mix in church on a Sunday, a few people. Right, keep your hands up. Sorry, uh, take your hands down if you've never had this complaint. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Tim, are you taking notes? We need to employ these people. Yeah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> It's too loud. Uh, this, is, this is a very common issue in churches. What do people mean when they say it's too loud? Here's a few ideas of the different things people mean. Uh, when people say it's too loud, 
that sounds like a very simple statement. Actually, it can be incredibly complicated. There can be a lot of different things people mean. Uh, the volume is causing physical discomfort. The volume is distracting or overbearing. Volume risks hearing damage. Uh, these, uh, these two particularly, uh, I think, are quite serious. This is perhaps a little more subjective. Uh, Somebody dislikes the musical style or ambience, or they, they just don't want to hear noisy instruments. For some people, if they can hear the electric guitar, it's always going to be too loud. It doesn't matter how loud it actually is. Uh, these are a little more subjective. How serious are they? It, I, it's it's going to be very different to different churches, depending on what your church is, is trying to do, what the kind of consensus is. Uh, there's a lack of clarity. This is a kind of semi-serious. Um, this can often, people often associate, when they can't hear something clearly, they, they think, oh, things are too loud. Uh, if I can't hear the vocal clearly, it's because the drum kit's too loud. Uh, it, it might be, uh, it probably isn't. Tim's gonna talk in a seminar later about a lot of things to do with clarity in church sound systems. Uh, so some of these are things we need to take seriously. Some of these are things that we need maybe take less seriously. Uh, these particular, I want to talk about these kind of issues. Before we do this, let's understand how we measure loudness. So sound pressure level is, is the uh, scientific measure of how loud something is. It's measured in a unit called Pascals. It's a physical pressure. It, it, uh, uh, sound fluctua is caused by fluctuation in air pressure and we measure the, the magnitude of that fluctuation. Uh, we usually describe it in decibels. Decibel is the most misunderstood unit in all of science. What is a decibel? Decibel is a unit of ratio. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with sound. You could describe a ratio of anything in decibels. You could describe how many elephants this zoo has compared to that zoo in decibels. If you wanted, it would be ridiculous, but it, the point is that it's not a unit of sound. It's a, it's a description of ratio. It's used for describing ratios between very large and widely varying numbers, which is why we use it for sound, because SPL in Pascals changes dramatically. The, the smallest sound we can hear is about 2 times 10 to the minus 5 Pascals. That's 0 0.000002. 000 uh, pain and hearing damage starts to occur about 200. There's a difference in a factor of 7, 10 to the 7. Those are enormously different numbers. How do we compare and contrast them? We use the decibel as a ratio rather than trying to talk in terms of these completely ridiculous numbers. Uh, in acoustics, we typically make the reference level the threshold of human hearing. Can anybody tell me what that means? What's the implication of that? Okay. What it means very simply is that 0 dB is the threshold of hearing. Uh, so if you compare a sound that is the same as the ratio of hearing, it will give us a zero dB number. Uh, so we measure everything against. So technically there can be sounds that are minus decibels, we just can't hear them. The threshold of pain occurs at about 120 decibels, but People will report physical discomfort. They may describe it as pain at lower levels. Uh, to be honest, this is completely subjective. Uh, some people, this will be 80 dB, they'll start to feel uncomfortable. Some people, it'll be 110 dB, they start to feel uncomfortable. Personally, uh, I find it's about 95-ish for me, but it's different for everybody. It's completely subjective. Uh, it it, it de depends on, on the person, the environment. There are places I will find 95 to be too much. There are places I will think 105 is great. If I've gone to a rock concert and I've kind of warmed up to it and I want it, I'm a lot less prone to find that at this comfortable level. It's, it's a very subjective thing. Uh, but 120 dB is the point where we're, we're starting to really do some damage. <coughs> hearing loss. Okay, noise-induced hearing loss is a permanent damage that occurs to the human auditory system due to exposure to sound impetus. So this is the, the damage sound can do to our auditory system. All sound exposure contributes to noise-induced hearing loss over time. Uh, there is no safe level, okay? A lot of people have this idea that there's a point where all of a sudden this sound is too loud, this is damaging. It's a load of rubbish. Every sound you hear is very slowly, very gradually damaging your hearing system uh, throughout the course of your lifetime. It's why 
as you grow older, you tend to get hearing loss. Age-related hearing loss is, you can't avoid it. It will happen to everybody. Uh, if you think that somehow you're immune to it, you're not. Uh, so there is no safe level. However, prolonged exposure to high sound levels will accelerate the rate at which this hearing loss occurs. So we want to avoid too much exposure to too high a sound level. Sound levels of the law. Okay, the Control of Noise at Work Regulations 2005. This is the official legislation in the UK that dictates how much sound somebody can be exposed to in the course of their work. So this creates obligations on the part of employers with respect to their employees. Uh, this regulation has nothing to do with members of the public, what you do outside of work. If you go to a loud rock concert, you make an informed choice to go to a loud rock concert, it can be way over what is allowed in the noise at work regulations uh, because you've chosen to go there. Uh, there is, nobody has a responsibility, so there is no legal limit to how much noise you could be subjected to at a rock concert. Unless you work there. Unless you work there. Yes, so, does this apply to church? Some churches employ people. Okay, it's a bit of a grey area. My opinion is that this does apply to a church service because there are people who are employed to be there. If you have a minister who is paid money to be the minister, part of his obligation in that role is that he's employed to be present and be involved in the church service, so the church as an employer has an obligation to the minister. Uh, the church has no obligation to the congregation, legally. Uh, what is a very grey area is, does the church have an obligation to volunteers, for instance? If you're a volunteer sound operator or musician, uh, do you fall within this or not? It's a bit of a grey area. I don't necessarily want to give you an answer. Um, but I think that the, the, the the important thing is that if, if anybody in your church is employed by the church, this is going to apply to them. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll rush through this very, very quickly. What do the noise at work regulations impose? Uh, there are two important measures. Daily exposure level, which is the average level of noise you're exposed to throughout an eight-hour working day. And the peak level, which is the maximum peak level you're exposed to at any point within your working day. There are three key action levels that the Noise at Work regulation sets out. First is the lower exposure action level. You have crossed the boundary of the lower exposure action level if you meet either of these two criteria. A daily or weekly average exposure of 80 dB or a peak exposure of 135 dB. Uh, that's an incredibly loud noise. <laughs> uh, we're not going to get anywhere near that in church. That potentially is, is more reasonable. If you cross the lower exposure action level, employers have a responsibility to make hearing protection available to their employees. Uh, so basically, as far as the church is concerned, what does this mean? This means that you would need to make sure that you offer earplugs to your minister. In <laughs> that's, that's it. That's as far as it goes. Upper exposure action level. This is the second level that we're concerned with. This is a daily or weekly exposure of over 85 dB or a peak of over 137, either of those and you cross that threshold. What does this require of employers? Employers must enforce the use of hearing protection by employees whose exposure exceeds these levels. So now, not only do you have to supply your minister with earplugs, but somebody's responsible for actually making sure he puts them in. <laughs> Again, this only applies to people who are employed, it doesn't apply to the congregation, so you don't need to be handing out earplugs on the door and making sure everybody's wearing them. Uh, but anybody who's employed by the church, you technically have an obligation. Exposure limit. Daily or weekly exposure of 87 dB or a peak SVL of 140 dB LA peak. Uh, this is the absolute maximum that somebody is allowed to be subjected to after hearing protection. So if somebody has a hit, uh, an earplug which takes 20 decibels, uh, actually the, peak, the, the daily or weekly exposure would be 107 because you're taking 20 off that with the hearing protection. So, is my church service exceeding legal levels? Very unlikely, okay? Uh, we're, we're mostly concerned with that upper action level. Uh, lower action level is not really a problem. It's very easy to offer some people some earplugs. Uh, the obligations become a lot more severe when we exceed the upper action level. In a typical one and a half hour service, Remember, the, we're looking at an eight-hour average, so if somebody's only employed for an hour and a half for a service on a Sunday, uh, we can go way above 80. 
In fact, we can go up to 92. So if, if you're averaging your sound level of 92 dBA throughout a one and a half hour service, then you've exceeded that upper action level. That is an extremely high number for a, a, a continuous average. Uh, you will, at points in a loud church service somewhere, like you go to Soul Survivor or HDB or somewhere, they will probably at points get over that level, but they are never going to be averaging that. As soon as you, the band comes off the stage and someone comes up to talk, you're way, 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 way lower. So, realistically, uh, I don't think most churches need to be concerned with this. Okay, reducing sound levels. What if it really is too loud? What if we need to reduce the volume in some way? It's not often as simple as just turning it down. Uh, it's very nice to think, oh, I've got a master fade, or oh, I'll just pull that down a few decibels, it'll turn everything down by that many decibels. It doesn't work like that. It's a lot more complicated than that. Cool, Pat, I'm going to stop you there.